I remember when I was young, I used to sit with my dad every once in a while when he listened to a shortwave radio. That thing picked up stations from all around the world. And every once in a while, something unusually interesting would be reported. Sometimes you'd even hear it twice. And we'd sit and we'd wait and wait for an expanded update. But usually, we would never ever hear it again. It would just disappear so completely as to make me question whether or not I'd even really heard it the first time. But then I grew up, got married, I moved to LA, and I had a baby. I also had newspaper delivery and cable TV. And, since I was an at-home mom, a friend of ours bought me a computer. He thought I should be a writer. And so a few days later, I got on the internet. And a couple of days after that, I found the land of the lost story. other side, the reverse angle, the rumors and innuendo. I found, it seemed, the exact opposite of everything else I was hearing, everything that my husband believed, and that I had almost stopped to question. Who were these people, these writers and photographers, chroniclers and commentators, keepers of conspiracies and debunkers of conventional beliefs? Were they just paranoids? people with too much time and willing keyboards? Were they really destructive liars, faceless members of some vast right-wing conspiracy? That's what my husband believed. And that's what I'd been told to believe. But hey, when the year is 1999 and you have a child to raise and you value the truth, well, sometimes some things are actually worth investigating. Urban legend and conspiracy fodder numero uno, Area 51, a rumored top secret installation in the middle of Nevada, and therefore, not one of the easiest places to find. Now we have to go to Area 51. Nobody knows where it is. In fact, I asked the guy, he says, no, I don't think it's a real place. Yes, it is. And it's about 80 miles north from here. North on what highway? You have to use 95. Okay. Like you go to Reno, you know. Up 95, past Indian Springs, past Betty, that is about 50 miles, then 30 more miles, that's where the Area 51 is. And it's right there on, on I-95? Yeah, but it's some behind the mountains right there. Right. So there's no way to get in over there because there is a uh, guard, you know. There's a guard, but are there yeah. signs and fences and... It's only safe, don't trespass, that's what it says. about the base? Well, I, uh, I grew up uh, in the Highland Park District of Los Angeles, uh, which is about four or five miles from what is now Hollywood Burbank Airport. It used to be Lockheed, and that used to be their, their skunk works plant back then, and that's where they were building their state-of-the-art aircraft that were being tested over here. So that's where I heard about this general region, not not anything real specific other than there was a place called Groom Lake out here and it was it was a hellhole for the workers because there was nothing to do and it was hot. But they were testing aircraft and I've always been interested in aircraft. So I've always you know been fascinated. Plus the the, flat, the fact that they deny that it's here uh, adds to the mystery, you know, so you know. Now they still don't deny it's here. They still officially deny that it's here. Ago, they went to the trouble of planning a story that although it's never officially been here, 
It's been closed down and moved from here now. In the June 1997 issue by uh, Jim Wilson, the uh, science editor of Popular Mechanics. Uh, he came out here in January of that year late. Uh, I spoke with him here at the end. And, you know, he said that I have a source at the Pentagon that's told me that everything has been moved. And I informed him that that was incorrect because I'd been keeping track of activities. And he told me where he was going to go. And I said, well, if you want to go out there, go ahead. That has really nothing to do with Area 51. It's, it's a bombing range boundary. It's about eight miles from where you want to be but I don't want to discourage you, go ahead, but take this little side trip. And I gave him a specific times and things that he'd see. And I assumed that he'd do that. He actually used a couple of my photos in his article, which we'd agreed to before he left, but then he contacted me later. And then he sends me an advance copy of the magazine along with the check and my photos back. And uh, he'd ignored everything I told him. He hadn't checked it out. He wrote it like, you know, there's no guards around. None of this is, is there. It's all been moved. And if he'd have been standing in the middle of the road at about 340 by the boundary, he would have been run over by the worker bus. You don't get to be a, a science editor without checking out things that you, you're told, especially when somebody makes it that simple for right. you. But I, I was told that he'd published something that he might have gotten into trouble with over national security on another matter and basically they held that over his head you know threatened prosecution okay. and said we want you to run this story and so they gave him the story they wanted it and and he did it under his byline uh as the story goes uh the u.s government came into possession of an advanced technology in the desert outside of roswell in 1947 uh, Certainly at that time, we're a year and a half out of World War II, we're within a few miles of where the nuclear bomb was developed. Uh, certainly there would be a national security issue because they wouldn't know how to treat this and they'd treat it as, as a potential enemy initially and then there'd be a good reason for secrecy. We don't know what happened, but we know something happened. The thing that all of us around here are convinced of is that something happened in 47 they've been lying about since military cover-up. One day they announced it, the next day they say it was a weather balloons, you know, and all that sort of thing. So what I'm saying is you probably haven't had that much experience with the government, but they'll lie to anybody anytime in the in the folly of national security, see? See? Oh, it's national security, bang, bang, we don't want you to see. And it, it means just that to them. Over 50 years has transpired now and, and we're not much closer and for a while there was a legitimate need to keep things secret and then I think I think they're doing everybody a disservice and maybe keeping doing themselves a disservice by uh, by keeping everything secret to this day uh, this much time has passed if these things presented some hostile front to us uh, I don't imagine we'd be here having this conversation after all that time No other 1999 event served to separate the mainstream media from the independent press quite like the April 20th horror, which took place in Littleton, Colorado. He talked to me all the time. He was nice to me, so was there. They were both really nice. So what happened? They just had done something wrong. Well, I think it's ridiculous that they're trying to, that everyone's trying to blame it on the video games like Doom and everything else the kids are playing. You act on your own judgments. You're, that, you're not right. Well, yeah. They're well within age. But I mean, but I mean, there's you millions. Still be influenced by video games. Anything yeah. that you see in life is very influential. These two young men, first of all, uh, uh, were certainly influenced by video games and such of a horrible, bloody, fiendish nature. But there's millions of kids in the United States that play those games, and the fact that they blaming two kids for. Uh, they blame the game for two kids doing something stupid out of millions. We have a culture in which 
<clears throat> the music and the the music, the entertainment, the uh, film industry, television. I'm not trying to lay it all off on them. It sounds like more of the breast beating and hair pulling, which I can't do too well. Uh, but there is a, there is a, what would you call it? We have glorified gore. TV, television, Channel 2 News, Channel 13 News, police, exactly. cops, everything that's on TV. It all has violence. It all has everything. We have glorified the angry young man and angry young woman to the point where everybody wants to be the angry young man and angry young woman. I mean, they had a guy on Channel 9 News. He'd called the cops before, said this guy's been threatening to kill me, and the cops didn't really follow through with it. The cops, I think they could have done a lot more. They could have prevented it totally. They were brought to psychiatrists. They were given mind-controlled drugs. My parents know everything that I have in my house. They know everything that's in my room. They know what I do. That's the, that's, they're supposed to do that. Well, they had the blueprints on the wall and everything. I mean, the cops could have easily one time gone in there and seen the blueprints for the bombs. They're smart enough to say, this kid's making bombs here. Find the bombs and make it preventable. If they'd have actually taken some of them seriously. Now, I think it's, it's not uh, outrageous to ask how could these two young men have planted 32 bombs and that school all by themselves. Everyone believes that they totally acted alone. No, it was just no the two not at all. No. Not at all. Not at all, because I mean, you know. There was a lot of stuff that was said. How are they going to carry those many propane Thank bombs into the school? How are they going to do all that? You have to have more than two people to plan all this stuff and to get all the weapons and stuff they had. Well, they, they, and, and, and they steal backpacks and plant bombs in other students' backpacks and they're going to pick them up or go running with their backpack with a load. Why is it? that a teacher was allowed over hours to bleed to death with the, with the exact knowledge they had the authorities on the phone. They said, come save him. He's here in this room. He's bleeding to death. Is that not what police are paid to do? I was in the Air Force for 20 years, over 20 years. And I was told there may come a time when you will have to go places and do things and perhaps sacrifice your life and you will do it. And if you're not willing to do it, get out, get out of uniform. These people were law enforcement officers. They're also trained. They're trained with SWAT teams. What have we spent millions of dollars for our law enforcement to do? Go in and protect the innocent, the vulnerable. They should have gone in the building. They were held off by the federal authorities for hours on end, unable to go in there. Knowing these two uh, men, actually they didn't know how many they claimed, how many men are in there with guns killing hundreds of school kids and teachers? They didn't know, but they said, we'll just stay out here where it's safe and let all of the murders and the horrible things transpire inside the school. And then after hours are spent, maybe they run out of shells out of killing, massacring hundreds, then we'll go in. Yeah, it sounds really intense. It's kind of an out operation. Well, there are rumors that there's a third shooter. I really believe there was. I think. And I, I, I thought I knew who did it, and then that person was apprehended and then released. An FBI psychologist was assigned to Littleton, Colorado, beginning about two years before this incident. And it just so happens that his own son was going to this school. And his son was one year ahead, uh, in other words, he graduated one year ahead of, of Klebold and Harris. Uh, and uh, it just so happens that his son joined the trench coat mafia and actually assisted Harris and Klebold in this video that they produced, which right there in the school, the school helped them, you might say, even graded them on their efforts they created a video, as you know, from what we're told in the media, which showed these kids coming in, blasting and killing people right there in the school, going down the hallway, m mowing people down and such, which is exactly what they did later. Well, they were in the video class. Right. And they were doing special effects graphics. And what they did is on Independence Day, you know, when UFO shoots a beam down and the White House blows up. Right. They did the same thing, but they did it over the school. Interestingly enough, it was an FBI agent's son who was a year older than them, who assisted them. Now, he graduated from school and went on. Now, this very FBI agent was assigned to the case. He, in fact, is the FBI agent in charge of the Littleton incident.
I had no idea who would do this before. Obviously, you can't tell who would do it. If, I, I know a lot of people, and I know, didn't count one person that I thought would do it. Right. And it ended up being someone I knew that I thought would do it. You can't tell. We as Americans especially love, we, we love a good conspiracy theory. We just love it. If we can't find one, we'll create one. So at the drop of a hat, we'll create a Not to say that conspiracies don't exist. I, I wouldn't believe that for a moment either. But I say we, we, we go way out of our way to create ones or make bigger ones out of small ones. Or <laughs> Who knows? What if there wasn't coincidence theory? You wouldn't have to replace it with conspiracy theory or anything <laughs> sinister like that. But coincidence theory just doesn't hold up. Whether it's Oklahoma or whether it's Littleton, it's strange how these things tend to surface when we're in anticipation of specific legislation that people are trying to propose. That's what feeds the conspiracy buffs with all kinds of bizarre views. A lot of people say that um, the National Guard has replaced what was the militia. That's Think not of. exactly true. Uh, th there is still a state militia. Uh, they're a fairly well organized uh, organization. Um, we don't have any specific ties to them. Uh, and I think, uh, again, the public gets confused when they think of the militia that they see in Oklahoma and Ohio and some of these other areas uh, and the militia when it's discussed in North Carolina. Because, like I said, um, we've got a very well organized militia and, and in fact a couple of the leaders have, uh, I've known personally and uh, are ex-military personnel and, and uh, are in it for uh, the good of mankind. The whole gun ownership thing is a much more complex question and it's tragic that these interests prey upon the naivete of the American people to use the incidents like Littleton to promote that. Just as they did at Oklahoma City, the, the Mira office building thing, uh, we, there's never been a connection between the principals that were charged with that and the militias. But they, within an hour, they were hammering the militias that they were used propaganda-wise. And the real tragedy isn't the, uh, the uh, corruption of the media so much as the naivete and the illiteracy in the American people, that they, they uh, are so used to being spoon-fed rather than doing their own thinking, rather than doing their own homework. Every time some idiot picks up a gun and does something stupid, some other idiot, under the guise of some intellectual suit uh, mentality, jumps up and starts screaming, outlaw, 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 outlaw everything, outlaw guns, outlaw bullets, outlaw, you know, hey, we live in a violent society here. This is a very violent society. The United States is probably the most, one of the most violent societies in, on, on the planet. Now, there, there are some that are much more. If we didn't have guns, we would use baseball bats. And if they outlawed baseball bats, we would use rocks. It's... <laughs> the gun just happens to be the weapon of choice. In fact, if you do the statistics show that where there is a high level of gun ownership and where there's a high level of permits to carry, you know one of the interesting things people do when they look at counties to go move to, they check the records to see how many permits to carry a concealed weapon have been issued by the sheriffs in those areas. And you'll notice there's an inverse correlate where there's lots of permits to carry, there's very little crime. I personally believe that, that there are legitimate reasons that an individual should be given the opportunity or, or, or permission to carry a concealed weapon. Um, there are requirements for that. The restrictions that are placed on purchasing guns right now, I think are a good thing. I don't think you'll find a, a law-abiding citizen be overly concerned about having to wait for three days or a week if he wants to purchase a weapon. The people that you're going to find concerned are those people that I think that are of questionable character and want to buy one right now to do something with this. And uh, the, the issue is, are we for self-defense or not? Uh, the idea that uh, you somehow can legislate morality, the idea that you somehow can create legislation that will avoid 
the bad guys from getting guns is naive. I can go out here in the corner. I can go out here on the street in 15 minutes, buy a half a dozen guns. Cheaper than I can at a gun shop without any questions asked. Now, that's all we need to correct. Now, if someone passes a gun, the, the background check, should they be registered? Do you think every gun owner should be registered? Registered with whom? With, with the government? With, the federal with, with government? some kind of, yeah, with some kind of a central federal database? Do you think everyone should be registered in that? Do you think that's necessary? Do you think that's something that should be left up to the states? I think the states could probably hand that, handle that reasonably well. If you go back and look at the Constitution, they, everybody interprets the Constitution of the United States in a different way. They're trying to impose gun control on us. They want to take our weapons away from the private citizens because they say, you know, gun control, gun control. You know, and they tell us that the Constitution of the United States says that we were never uh, promised uh, having weapons in our home, only for hunting and whatever. The gun control thing, to me, is not that doesn't seem that controversial. In, in my mind, it's part of a, a, a broader tide of, uh, of power grabs, trying to increase the control of the elite. I was a cop for 11 years. Old-time cops all say, what are you, crazy? You should have a gun. Young cops that are trained differently and taught differently and came up under this different coddle system, oh no, only the police should have, have a gun. And by the way, if you call us in a large city, we can get there within two hours. Duh! I don't know what this country, what these people in this country, these people, they want the government to take care of them. The government's not going to take care of them. The only thing the government's going to do is take them and, and before long, they're going to be just like the Russian people was 10 years ago. If you don't do this, we send you over there. We take your kids and do this and do that. I mean, it's a coming thing. You know, anybody can look at it and see it. There's new equipment coming in. Governments are concerned. Government's big business. It's probably the biggest business when you get right down to it. Government is big business, so expect it to react like business. It will take care of itself before it'll take care of you. Government will feed itself before it feeds you. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, senators or whatever, they make a career out of uh, the government, and we pay. The American people pay for their livelihood. Free Republic, a conservative online forum, and Judicial Watch, an independent public interest organization, they were joining together on July 24th at a rally in the nation's capital. question of our country. It is a question of our love of this nation, of doing what is right, of not mouthing the words that the White House puts in your mouth or the Republican Party puts in your mouth, but saying what is good for this country. What seems to be in shortest supply is a number of people willing to concentrate on just one thing, which is in some ways the only thing that we need in the way of leadership in this country today, and it's the one thing that it's hardest to get. People who are willing, regardless of the cost and consequences, simply to concentrate upon seeking and finding and telling the truth to the American people. And now we have an administration that is proud to say it substitutes deniability for accountability and considers that to be clever and has replaced the word truthfulness with the word credible, where credible now is the chance you have of getting away with a reiterated, planned and configured damn lie. We have politicians who are more interested in manipulation than they are in service, who have as their main goal making sure they get and keep their positions of power. 
and who are there for every day simply trying to figure out what do I have to say to these folks to get them to keep voting. It doesn't matter if it's the truth. It doesn't matter if it reflects what is on their minds and hearts. It doesn't matter if it is good for this country. They will tell whatever lies they have to tell. They might occasionally even tell the truth if it will serve their purposes. But probably not. Because after all, if you tell the truth, it binds you thereafter. If you tell a lie, you can always tell another one to death. But what are the consequences of this era of lies? Points are awarded and credit is given by my profession to its undying shame every day to those who pass that test of credibility. How plausible are they when they lie? How electable does it make them? And then adding, how much money have they got? And have degraded us below the level of a banana republic by making the lie and the war chest the only test for a public official in these United States. It's understood by most people who are prominent uh, celebrities that uh, the media is is is, uh, is is you can't trust them and, and it's and it's managed. The amazing thing to me is as you switch channels at night, say the four or five major networks, um, you get the same five or six stories from the same viewpoint on all the channels. You used to think, gee, it'd be competitive that each one would try to scoop the other, but that's naive. That they're very they're, they're t the the news in this country is very well managed. I had uh, opportunity years ago to have lunch with Otto von Habsburg, whose father ruled Europe until the end of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And he's a member of the European Parliament. But at that luncheon that we were at, uh, a group of us were meeting with him, he made two remarks to us that were, were very provocative at the time to me. One, he made one remark echoed in my ear. He says, the ignorance in America is overwhelming. Now, I knew what he meant about that one because I, understood, I was always startled. When I went to my London office in those days, I was amazed at how the local staff knew all about the elections in California, more than I did. They really follow current events. The, it seems as if the number one hobby in Europe is current events worldwide, not just in Europe. And it used to embarrass me, because I myself wasn't that well informed about our, some of our local issues. Uh, so I knew what he meant, that the Americans, all they care is what, what were the ball scores last week and not what's really going on in the world. But the second remark he made, I didn't understand at the time, that's why it echoes in my ears. He says the concentration of power in America is frightening. When he made that remark at the time, I didn't understand it. And since then, I think I understand what he means. There was, a, about 15 years ago, there were 2,200 independent new, newspapers in the United States. And today, uh, all but 5% are owned by just a, a small number of families. The concentration of power in the media is really terrifying. And coupled with that, especially with television, the, the coupled with that, uh, the media takes pride in its ability to form opinion rather than to inform the electorate. I believe that the root of that indifference is the same as the root of that passivity that lack of activism in the reclaiming of our rights, which leaves us now in a position to be despoiled of them. New York City. Rumored to be approaching police state status, we stopped in to catch up on friends, events, and a little downtime. Nobody's talking, and as usual, New Yorkers don't really seem to care. Yeah. Do you live here in New York City, sir? I do. And I would like to know how do you feel about the 
feel about the fact sir, that you cannot walk up the steps of City Hall? Uh, I take it in stride. I think it's uh, you know part of all the construction that's going on. But they had this shut down before for terrorists, remember? That's yes. why they initially yes. put it up. And then, what do you think about this? Well, I think it's pretty ugly looking, but I think eventually maybe it'll look attractive. But in the meantime, it's a real eyesore, considering that this is the height of the tourist season. So aesthetically is what displeases you the most. Right. Because you were well, probably going to go up there anyway. I mean, I don't care about... I mean, I really don't care about the politics or the access issue, but I, it offends me aesthetically as a New Yorker. The fact, sir, that you cannot walk up the steps of City Hall. Well, they did this uh, barricade because of fear of uh, terrorists. Right. Because of what happened with the World Trade, they felt that uh, terrorists could walk in, plant a bomb in there. Just a scheme by the Giuliani administration to keep protesters and people that don't agree with them away. It's kind of mildly interesting that you can't walk up these steps into the building anymore. I think it's disgraceful. You do you? Absolutely. And it's typical Rudy Giuliani. I think it's Fort Giuliani, isn't it? I you, guess. You can't get in there. No, I can't. No. And they also cannot answer any questions. Well, I, why should they answer any questions? How do you know the answer you're, anyway? You're a member of the public. Why should you know? I know. I know. Police department, you understand? We're in a police state right now. I don't have much stock in government, so I'm an anarchist. I feel like you understand the cops, you understand, are doing things with you on the cause of duty that they shouldn't have. Shouldn't have to do you understand to keep you from having a good time in this city. This this city is not New York no more, and it never will be New York no more with this government that we got running right now. I'm distrustful. I'm not a paranoid person. I don't believe in conspiracies, but I think everything's a huge smokescreen, and I'm totally skeptical about anything that comes out from the media. I don't think there's any difference really in any of the political parties. We have a greater slavery going on now than they've ever had in the South. Uh, something I've fought hard for, worked hard for, to get out of a different situation in the South. All of a sudden, you know, say here's 1999, we're in the same situation we did you know, in the 1960s. And I really, I think that we need to stick together. You know what I'm saying? We stick together, you know, work together and live in the happiness and harmony instead of killing each other and fighting each other all the time. Are we angry? Why should we be angry? We're making $10 million a fucking year playing basketball. We're making $13 million playing baseball. Why should we be angry? Us as black people, you know, being able to work together is not really working out. With thousands of years of wisdom, well, they say in the aging, corruption starts in the head of a rotting fish. White man don't run this country no more. The white man have lost his throne. He don't run this country no more. He got other other race of people running this country. He sells this country. It's like Machiavelli's book, Prince. I think government scramble people so badly and exhaust them that the average citizen taken in New York City, they're so distressed just working or trying to put food on the table. They have no time to uh, communicate with each other. We get weaker and weaker every day. No, not by nobody else destroying us, but by us destroying ourselves. In 1999, the unthinkable happened. Stories were hinted at and printed up that gave credence, albeit grudgingly and reluctantly, to many years of claims by conspiracy theorists, thereby making them, for the first time in the mainstream, conspiracy factualists. We didn't know how much would eventually come out this year. However, we did know that in Waco, Texas, 86 Americans burned to death under dubious circumstances and splintering cover-ups, and that we had been led to believe that they deserved it. These are David Crush's underground rooms. He was telling the people a year in advance the government would come and kill him. And he was building underground as fast as he could. There's remaining foundation in this area. At the front of the remaining foundation is an underground room that was under the building itself. It took us four years to find the escape tunnels coming out of that room because there was a deliberate effort to conceal them, I think. The uh, doorways to the tunnels were cemented shut and the room was lined with plywood like the wood in the doorways.
son has become a 1999 story, so I just want to ask what you think if the truth will actually come out now about Waco. Well, if the truth doesn't, it's over. Um, I think it's high time that we recognize the criminalization of the executive branch in general. And I think that it's high time we had some accountability. When that was all going on, I remember vividly that Janet Reno assuming responsibility before the camera. Okay, let's let her be responsible. We have over 80 Americans that were deliberately murdered by the U.S. government. The evidence is there. You must understand that not one agent who was at the raid on the scene on the 28th made a written report of it. That's highly irregular. On March the 1st, the ATF initiates a shooting review. Johnston, the assistant United States attorney, advised Hartnett to stop the ATF shooting review because ATF was creating Brady material. Brady material, ladies and gentlemen, is information that might tend to show that someone accused is innocent. Some, they try to explain this to say, well, uh, that just meant, you know, we, have, we don't want to, what, compromise the prosecution. You don't want to compromise the prosecution by revealing evidence that might tend to show that somebody is not guilty of the charges? Well, that's not where we are in this country, I hope. There's never been accountability at Waco, and not only was it a bungled thing by the, the, the ATF, the cover-ups, uh, that, that to me is as scary a crime as the event itself. What could be called an infantry tank maneuver. We notice the tank, this is the tank smashing into the building. And we'll also see gunfire, multiple gunfire, on the outside of the tank to the rear of the tank. And right now, we're seeing a close-up view of exactly the same thing. The important thing to notice is the gunfire, multiple rounds being fired from at least two different positions. And it's about 10 bursts in approximately two to three seconds. And according to our calculations, uh, it indicates that both positions are firing automatic weapons. There needs to be, uh, somewhere along the way, one would hope that, uh, the, you know, that the, these things will be, uh, that truth would be served. Uh, Carisha's survivors number around 35. But uh, that were in the building? Nine people came out of the fire. Nine? Yeah. Most, uh, a lot of them are serving 40 years, 25 years. Oh. They, they mostly went to jail to become political prisoners. I think part of the problem is that there aren't any clean hands to go after this. You know, there isn't an Elliot Ness or whatever to get into the act. But uh, the corruption is so widespread on both sides of the aisle. What may perhaps be perceived as a mild irony to my passionate quest for truth, justice, and the American way is that, well, I'm an immigrant. And as we were coming into New York Harbor early in the morning, about 6 o'clock, we passed by the Statue of Liberty. And as importantly, we passed by Ellis Island. And I thought to myself, and I choked up, that I was going to be here today speaking to you. Because we are all the descendants of immigrants from Europe and the rest of the world. And I thought of my grandparents who passed through Ellis Island back in the early part of the 20th century, and what they expected of this country. People who fled the communist regime in Russia, tyranny in Poland, Lithuania, Latvia. All right, obviously, being Canadian, I didn't come here escaping persecution. Partly because I'm an immigrant to these shores, as perhaps some of you can tell, I'm not native, that I have a sense of a desecration. Sometimes immigrants are more reverent about the old country than uh, those who were lucky enough to be born here and to take a constitution and a bill of rights as their birthright, which I was not. To me, truth by its definition is narrow. Is it really out there? Is it knowable to the common man? And in the end, is it worth whatever the accompanying costs to seek it out? Egotistical enough to think that our Creator, probably what you want to, created.
created this. We don't even see the end of, the, of, of what the universe is. I'm trying to stay with the nuts and bolts end of it. I don't want to get into meaning or, or, or origin. It would seem to me unreasonable to believe that we're alone here in this vast, so vast it's incomparable to, to the human mind, this vast universe. There's too many billions of suns out there that have planets going around them that could be comparable to ours to not say some sort of intelligent life exists. Two of us here have reasons to believe attended the last international uh, conference on the origin of life. And the thing we noticed was just the atmosphere of pessimism amongst the non-theists that there is no way to explain the origin of life. We now know it happened rapidly on planet Earth, but it happens rapidly with oxygen present and there's no possibility of a natural explanation. You're forced to concede that it must be supernatural. So the fact that even secular researchers are recognizing uh, that this can't be done, in fact, some have speculated, we know it's impossible on Earth. It must have happened somewhere in outer space and came to planet Earth by some transport mechanism. There's a lot of theories now that, uh, uh, yeah, the aliens came here 5,000 years ago and started all this. The problem with that is we know the panspermia theory uh, only works over interplanetary distances. You cannot take life material from a star and get it to Earth in any form that would be recognizable beyond carbon dioxide or hydrogen cyanide. It's just not going to happen. The radiation that's necessary to move that stuff is so intense it'll break it down. Do I believe there are aliens? Hell yes. Do I believe they visited here? Probably no doubt. Do I believe that we're the descendants of aliens? Absolutely. What is the possibility of finding a planet like Earth with the capacity to support life if you don't invoke the creator god of the Bible? And it's easy to determine the odds are less than 1 in 10 to the 109 of finding a solar system like ours that can support life. When you look at the universe, uh, we have less than 1 chance in 10 and the 120th that you're going to get even the cosmological constant, the right value, to support life. Or the mass density of the universe must be fine-tuned within one part from 10 to 60. The whole UFO thing and alien thing is, is sort of a strange area. It's a very difficult area to research because there's so much nonsense, uh, some of it just silliness, a lot of it well-funded disinformation. That's part, in fact, part of the mystery that is why, because it's not self-recovering funding. There's too many people to see them. I, I had a sighting one night, yes, right out north of town. Friends of mine called me at 11 o'clock at night and. Well, I can tell you what I saw, it was unusual. But the one thing you do know about it is that I think it's 13 of our astronauts confirmed the reality of, of UFOs, etc. So the point is it's not, it's not the myth or fiction that some people presume. As you get in, as you discover, there is a reality to them. It was a thing like this right up in that north sky, and it was, you could, your naked eye, you could see it. And with binoculars, you could get it more details. Because they do show up in multiple radars simultaneously, on the one hand, so they're real, they're tangible. The radar sets don't have hallucinations. On the other hand, they violate physical laws. So a deputy sheriff and I stood there with our elbows on the top of the car looking at that thing, and we talked back and forth what it was doing. While we were there, another one the same size came up and hung up there beside it like this. And then it was there all 15 or 20 minutes, and then it moved off slowly to the northeast. This one didn't move. We spotted it with stars. It didn't move. They, they, they appear to be massless in many respects. And so uh, that's why most scientists that have gotten serious about this have come to the conclusion they're hyperdimensional somehow. It wasn't a balloon, or it didn't move. It wasn't an airplane, or it couldn't have stood still. And uh, the term that they use is demonic. So what was it? But it's interesting that Dr. John Mack, who uh, was the head of psychiatry for Harvard, uh, and uh, uh, shocked, he personally has dealt with these abduction stories, I think 76 cases personally and so forth, and he co-chaired the conference at MIT on the whole abduction thing. And he shocked the psychiatric world by coming out and, and expressing his view that these beings are real and that they have an agenda to create a hybrid. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of people are upset with him with that because that's you know not very in today to have that view. But his book Abductions deals with his views on this pretty pretty graphically. So uh, I don't know how much credibility put that. I don't know the man personally, but uh, I do. He has what a, a contributed to 150 peer-reviewed medical journals. He's got a Pulitzer Prize in his background. Uh, he's not to be dismissed lightly.
and yet he believes that, that there's a very, very real something going on. What do you think about aliens? I don't think there are any. At one time, I thought that there were simply based upon documents that I'd seen while I was attached to the intelligence briefing team, the commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet. At that time, uh, and, and even for many years afterwards, I did not believe that the government would use me in that way. I had devoted my whole life to government service. I had been in the Air Force. I was in the Navy. I was a river patrol boat captain in Vietnam. I had, uh, I had proved myself. I had combat ribbons with the V for Valor. Um, there was no doubt of my loyalty to my country. And maybe that's why it was so easy to use me, because I wouldn't doubt that what I saw was real. But over the years, I've done a lot of research. And what I've discovered is there's no proof existing anywhere that extraterrestrials are real, or that have ever visited this planet, uh, or that they exist anywhere in the universe. There is not one shred of evidence anywhere. There is lots of evidence, tons of it in fact, that there are a group of people collectively known as the Illuminati who want us to believe in some extraterrestrial threat from space so that they can cause a world government, you know, bringing together of all the people to resist that external threat. Uh, and uh, the first time that I saw any reference to that, I was reading some papers from the Carnegie Endowment Fund, and there was a record of a speech. Um, well, it was a dinner for Viscount Ishii of the Japanese delegation, the Japanese Imperial delegation, in 1917. And John Dewey was, was one of the speakers. And the first sentence out of his mouth as I was reading this almost fell out of my chair. Because this was in 1917, and he said the best way to cause all the people of the world to come together in one world government and end war forever would be if we were attacked by some other species from some other planet. And boy, that just clicked with me and I knew that, uh, that, that this is just another scam. This is the age of deception. There's no doubt about it. And then uh, eight times during Reagan's administration, he inserted almost the exact same phrase into eight of his speeches. And uh, It's a scam. <laughs> that's, that's what I can tell you. What they call UFOs, these craft that fly around the sky, are real. But they're not piloted by some little green guy from some other planet. They're owned and operated by the United States of America for one, the Soviet Union for another, uh, probably Great Britain, Canada. I think the, uh, the first really operable ones were probably manufactured in western Canada, in the wilderness, in a in a, in a place especially built to, to create those machines like we created uh, the Manhattan Project uh, and, and the same kind of secrecy surrounded it. So the technology is real. It's been kept secret and it's been used to promote this concept that there's an alien threat to this earth. The cattle mutilations I've discovered in my research are nothing more than than what's left after the government uh, does its secret tests on the, the low-level radiation leakage from its atomic weapons, assembly plants, and atomic power plants. It's a low-level radiation monitoring project. And if you look at what's missing on the cattle, you'll see that it's just as clear as day. They take the lips, they take the tongue, they take a six-inch patch of skin, they core out the the uh, rectum, the colon area, where those kinds of things would collect if they would pass through the, um, through the uh, digestive system. On, on female cows, they take the, they take the udder uh, to check for low-level radiation in the milk. Is it being passed to the, to the calves? And, and these are all grazing animals that graze on the grass that where the radiation falls when it falls from the air. And, uh, it's just an incredible deception. And I'm just amazed that people have fallen for it in the manner that they have in the absence of any proof whatsoever. I mean, they cite hearsay as proof. Well, what about all of the alien abductions? They're not abductions. They're the results of a tremendously successful and very sophisticated mind control operation, all of which has been in development uh, 
well, they started working on those kinds of things since before World War II. But they have perfected them. On my website, I have a patent of a machine that can read your brain waves, can recombine them in a computer and send them back to you, and make you think things happened that never happened. I mean, you can't get a patent for something like that unless it really works. You have to prove it to the patent office. It works. A patent was issued. And this is just one of the things that snuck by them that has it. Because when people invent things like this, they're sucked up by the government immediately, and then they're, they're put behind the veil of national security and classified, and then nobody knows about them. But every once in a while, something sneaks by them. And when you do these searches in the patent office and the trademark office and in the copyright office, you come up with some real gems once in a while, and that, that was one. Also, the congressional investigations into the, uh, the intelligence community has revealed the existence of these programs, and there's, there's no secret about it. It's documented. Project Artichoke, Project MK MKUltra, um, MK Naomi. Um, you know, I could go on and on and on all day long, and, uh, you know, if you had the time in your movie, we could lay out all the documentation, which is official government documentation and prove uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt that it's true. But that's what it is. It's not extraterrestrials coming down. The human body cannot pass through walls or roofs uh, or, or through windows that are closed. You know, this is all the product of the imagination and, and people's willingness uh, to believe something because they want it to be true. I don't know why they would want it to be true. You see, because if, if it were true, these are not friendly aliens. They're doing some terrible things to people. If I were to kidnap somebody, pass them up through the roof, and take them somewhere, and perform operations on them, and uh, take samples of semen and, and ova from their you know, reproductive organs, and, and uh, plant thoughts in their mind, and, and all this kind of stuff, and then bring them back, guess where I'd be right now? Be in prison. It's kidnapping. It's criminal. It's a terrible thing. So uh, there, there's a uh, there's a morbid sense about all this too, as if people want to be hurt for some reason. I don't understand that. But that that certainly is something that uh, that somebody needs to look at. Why do people feel that this needs to be real? What in them says I want to be abducted and abused and kidnapped and, and raped and, and uh, all of this stuff against my will because they seem to take uh, some kind of satisfaction that this is happening and, and nobody's talking about the fact that this is a terrible thing to happen. If I were to do that to you, you wouldn't be too happy, would you? But somehow it's okay if an alien does it? I don't think so. It's all bullshit. It's a lie. And it's that's, so where do you feel the hope for America lies? Oh, this is William Cooper, a man who received mainstream attention in 1994 when Rush Limbaugh read an alleged White House memo on the air calling him the most dangerous radio host in America. Maybe that's because his conspiracy classic is the underground bestseller, or perhaps it's because of the increasing popularity of his shortwave radio broadcast, which is also available on the internet. Good evening, you're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm still William Cooper. This was not an easy interview to net. He was the first person I asked, and after 8,000 miles and six and a half weeks on the road, just about the last to agree. I guess he wanted to make sure I was serious. Nevertheless, I had to come alone, and I was required to follow clear rules of conduct. Well, at this point, I've done so much research on this, um, I have to tell you, there's only one way this is going. There's going to be a civil war in this country, and I hope the outcome of the war will be the reinstatement of constitutional Republican government. But whenever you have a war like that, you're going to have competing factions to be the winner. And whoever really has the power in the end is going to institute whatever kind of government they feel should be there. There are people in this country who believe that a religious theology or theocracy uh, should prevail. Well, if that happened, we'd have burnings at the stake again and, and inquisitions 
and heretics and all of these kinds of things. So that can't be allowed to happen. Can't be. Doesn't matter what my religion is. It can't be allowed to happen. There are people who want a, a socialist uh, government, much like the one in Sweden. There are people who want to uh, create in the United States what the Soviet Union had hoped to be. Um, there are real Nazis, all of them socialists. Hitler was a socialist. So I see the future as being tremendously dangerous for all of us. Um, me and, and many others like me are, are going to perform a valiant attempt to reinstate, restore legitimate, lawful, constitutional Republican government. Whether or not we're going to be successful, I can't tell you. But I will tell you that once this war starts, it's going to be terrible, it's going to be bloody, and it'll last for 10 or 15 years. That's the nature of this kind of conflict. If you look around at all these mountains around here, there's enough guns, ammunition, supplies, clothing, and food buried in these mountains to support an army for 15 years. And I... I don't think the American people realize that they're on the brink of a civil war. You see, there are many of us who took an oath when we went in the armed forces and we meant it. We volunteered. We weren't drafted. We care about this country. And the oath was to protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And we will fulfill that oath, even if it means we die in the process of doing it. It's that simple. I started out as a young man uh, by joining the U.S. Air Force, and I spent over 20 years in the Air Force. Uh, and uh, of course, I believe that is a great service. I've joined the Marine Corps in 1962. I volunteered for the Marine Corps. I wanted to serve the United States to be patriotic. They ask you if you belong to any uh, organization, such as the Ku Klux Klan or anything like that, anything, the Mafia. If anything foreign to your, or if you're a communist, if it's foreign to your, your country, and you either answer yes or no. If you answer yes, they put you out. If you answer no, they swear you in. You take allegiance to, the, to your constitution in the United States and protect your country with your life. Let me tell you this, all of you, all across the nation and around the world, patriots are everywhere. By patriots, I mean men and women who serve freedom. Who are ready and willing to die for freedom should they ever be called upon to have to do that. It's not the Y2K. Majority of the people on this planet are running on calendars that aren't anywhere near the year 2000. Uh, Chinese, Hebrews. You know, so yeah, we're, we're kind of the exception. Well, we passed the 999 test yesterday, not one ripple. So that's going to make it really hard to push a Y2K disaster scenario. Tests were made as frequently or as far back as uh, 12 months ago. October 98 is when you should have seen the first ripple out and nothing happened. Nothing happened on January 1 of 99. That should have been another big disaster point. And we passed another one yesterday. And you get all the banks and government agencies saying they're ready. All the utilities say they're ready. So People say to me, well, you said things about Y2K text. If it doesn't come, it's not a great big horrible catastrophe. We're going to call you a false prophet. But I've never said, and I never would, that Y2K is in all. Well, the millennium fever this time around is a lot less than it was when we turned 1,000. So I expected there'd be a lot more millennial fever along the lines of other kinds of scenarios, like the lineup of planets or whatever, or you know, some big disaster about to strike the Earth from outer space. And I'm amazed there isn't that much of that going on. Think about Y2K. Uh -huh. They second me. They second me. 
Thank you very much. What do you think about Y2K? Yeah, it's very nice. Very cool. I think America has always been a very tolerant nation. I mean, we had the Great Depression, and, and people were put out of work in droves, people went hungry, there was no revolution. The American people seem to be eternally optimistic. We're preaching the 6,000 years of sin that precede the thousand year millennium kingdom. It's a sabbatical from sin. And uh, according to my great grandfather's Bible, that 6,000 years ended in 1996. Uh, that's using Usher's that's dating method. And he, he was a Congregationalist minister. He had a great, huge minister's Bible, 1888. And um, it gave uh, 4004 is the date of creation using Usher's dating method. They date all the kings, you know. And um, so that places us squarely at the time of setting up the kingdom of God on earth. And it seems to me millennial fever is appropriate. Well, that's our question. Is it millennial fever or is it justified heightened awareness? Well, uh, justified heightened awareness. I, th I think God is making a lot of things happen so that people wake up and realize that, for instance, America is not a perfect country. You know, and the uh, Branch Davidian massacre and the Ruby Ridge and the Oklahoma bombing are all telling the same story. Wake up, America. So what do you see happening in the next four to six months? In this well, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball. All I know is that the year 2000 is crucial to the plans of those who want world government because they whipped up sort of a millennium fever and they coupled that with Y2K and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, real religious people who think that this is the end of the world and Jesus is coming or somebody's coming imminently and uh, so there's this fever that's whipped up I mean everybody is, seems to be on the edge of some kind of hysteria uh, but it's all in their mind if you look around you see the world hasn't changed it's not coming to an end uh, this hasn't been brought about by the hand of God it's been brought about by the deceptions of man and the quicker people realize that and try and find out who is causing these things to, uh, to whip up this hysteria, the, the better off they're going to be. Hi, this is Isaac Hayes. I want to see you around for the next millennium, and I don't want you to get the shaft. So, fasten your seatbelt for safety. Dad, I need my seatbelt. We cannot escape the truth that a people who have surrendered its character is a people in the end who will surrender its liberty and its security. The freest societies are the ones that collapse the hardest. If you look back throughout history, the ones that really collapse the hardest and the fastest. But the free in what sense? The freest societies, the freest to, to let people run around and do as they want, act as they want, say what they want, give them anything they need. These are the ones that throughout history have reached a pinnacle of, of greatness and then bang, crashed almost overnight. I mean societies that didn't have a moral center. I gotta hate that. I know but, you uh, do. Uh, but, uh, but to a degree, yes. The family unit, God, I'm starting to sound like gore, but the family unit is just gone. You know, my, my great memories and the things I miss the most about family were, were like, Every morning, the family sat down at the breakfast table. We ate, we, ate, we ate breakfast together. We talked. Of course, Dad made enough money to where Mom stayed home and rent a house. You, know, uh, you could do that in those days. You can't do that anymore. Uh, lunch, of course, was a different story. But evening time, it wasn't formal, but it was, by today's standards, probably a formal meal. You know, the china was laid out on the table. Everybody had their place and set. And the meal was served. And, uh, you don't see that anymore. I think the greatest spot was the dinner table for a family. That's where families were formed. That's where, that's where the learning occurred. That's where the social structure developed. That's where the... The moral parameters were established. In my family, that didn't mean it was rigid. We were always encouraged to find our own because my father was the first to tell you that the morals of what somebody else decided was right for you. And only you can answer the truth for yeah. However, the idea was there. You don't have that anymore. You have real fractured, uh, 
loose concepts of family. Everybody on their own, everybody doing their own thing. Uh, where do you learn? How do you learn values? By whatever schmuck on the street who takes you under their wing for whatever purpose, you know. Mothers, be careful, teach your kids because they come to me, I'll take advantage of them. <laughs> I have no doubt that I will take advantage anytime I can. Uh, because they make it so fucking easy. That's why. <laughs> if you don't teach your kids at home, somebody in the streets will teach you. I think that we are very much in the position of those ancient cities and republics that waxed fat and soft until they were finally destroyed by barbarian enemies. We will not sustain our liberty if we do not sustain the character that makes us free. I can remember when I was in school. And almost every 4th of July, we had to write a little essay, what it means to be an American. And it was a boring thing. It was predictable. We had to go through that silly exercise, go through it, because it seemed so obvious. I don't think there's probably one person in 20 that I know that could tell me in writing what it does mean to be an American. What's unique about it being an American? It's not a democracy. We're not the first or the last. What makes us unique to be an American? There's a whole issue there of the values, you know, the, 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 and you go right back to the Declaration of Independence, the rest, you know, our creator, inalienable rights, that whole, that whole, the whole basis, the whole concept of government is, 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 uh, and was unique. We hold these truths to be self-evident, they said, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. When the, when the Constitutional Convention adjourned, as old Mr. Benjamin Franklin was leaving that meeting house in Philadelphia. And they were coming out. Some woman, apparently, I gather. I used to know her name. It was a Scottish name. I don't have it in my head just at the moment. Ask Ben Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? And he said, well, madam, a republic, if you can keep it. We don't have a government like other people that just evolved through history. We have a government that was designed prayerfully by geniuses. I've seen the best and worst that they've all got to offer, and this is the finest, the finest government and operating system for a government I've ever seen anywhere in the world. No one else can come even close to it. And it has stood well for a better part of two centuries. That now we've abandoned. We've let the revisionists strip our heritage away, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tragic. If we were as strong and as wise and as wonderful as some people try to claim we are because of our technological advances and all this, uh, then we wouldn't have spent the last 50 and 60 years destroying our liberties. We would have been wiser and, and we would have been stronger than that. What had happened to Columbine made everyone start thinking that we need to start straightening up our world or else this is what we're going to wind up being. It's just a crooked world like that. Mm -hmm. What do you think about my uh, uh, It's a good thing. <laughs> Can we ask you a question, sir? Yes. Hamlet, go ahead, ask. What do you think about Y2K? Y2K? Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, that just proved the man is not so wise as they say he is. But, you know, there is God in heaven who is wiser, who loves him. He sent his son Jesus to die for that he may live forever. Back in California, I reflect on several things. The people we met, the things they said, and who they really might be. Are they lunatics, liars, or heroes?